Indonesia. 17,000 islands stretched along the equator. The southern arc formed by a chain of active volcanoes that geologists call the Ring of Fire. It was from these islands that human beings set forth on our last great expansion into pristine environments, the colonization of the Pacific. My name's Steve Lansing. I'm an anthropologist, and I've been studying the cultures of these islands for over 30 years. In 2009, we discovered that one of the largest barriers to human migrations, equivalent to the Sahara or the Himalayas, occurs in the middle of a continuous chain of islands that were first colonized about 55,000 years ago. In the absence of physical barriers to gene flow, there must be another explanation. The break occurs along Wallace's line, the famous Pleistocene boundary between Asia and Australasia. These are Asian Y chromosomes. They quickly disappear east of the Wallace line. Y chromosomes are carried only by men. X chromosomes spend twice as much time in women as in men. And more of the X chromosomes cross the Wallace line. But was this a small effect? Consider the population of the island of Flores, east of the Wallace line. The mitochondrial DNA, which is carried by women, is almost completely Asian. The X chromosomes, which spend twice as much time in women as in men, are mostly Asian. Autosomes are recombined in a process we call sex, half from the father and half from the mother, and they're about half Asian. Finally, only a very few of the male Y chromosomes are Asian. We see this pattern on one island after another, and it grows stronger as we go east. So what happened to the men? The Pacific was explored by small numbers of voyagers in sailing canoes. By tracing the genetic evidence from their modern descendants, we made a surprising discovery. For unknown reasons, few Asian men crossed the Wallace Line. And there's a second mystery. When the Austronesians arrived in the islands, they brought their languages with them. But nearly all of the islands were already inhabited by people who spoke their own languages. Yet nearly all of those original languages disappeared. Within a few thousand years, Austronesian languages, carried by small numbers of colonists, replaced the indigenous languages on hundreds of islands across half the globe. How did that happen? That's how this project began. I thought that if we could collect both language and DNA samples from the islands that were the stepping stones for the Austronesian migration, then we might be able to tease out the different histories of men and women. But for that, we would need more samples. My colleague, Harawati Sudoyo, is the executive director of the Ekman Institute for Molecular Biology in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. Hera's goal is to map the genetic diversity of the archipelago but most of her work has to do with medical genetics. But like me, Hera was surprised to discover that the Wallace line was a barrier to Austronesian males. So we decided to try to reconstruct what happened when the Austronesians arrived on the island of Sumba. Sumba lies just to the east of the Wallace line, and traces of the Austronesian culture are everywhere in stone monuments to the ancestors, and in the languages and DNA of the Sumbanese people. From the village of Waimangura in uh, northwest Sumba, public health staff and the team from the Eichmann Institute are collecting health histories, talking about malaria and hepatitis, answering people's questions, and collecting some samples. But I'm going to be asking questions about language. There are eight domains in West Sumba, each of which has its own individual language, most of which are unintelligible from one little domain to the other. There's even one region just to the north of here where there's a language that's spoken by people in only three villages. Are all the languages of Sumba Austronesian? Do they all trace back to a single mother language brought by the Austronesian colonists? To find out, we need to collect samples of language variation 
and use them to reconstruct the history of all the languages of Sumba. This is East Sumba, July 2005. This tape is going to have the third of three tapes containing word lists. Take the English word to fly. It would be translated differently in each of the languages of Sumba. So far, the linguistic evidence suggests that all of the languages of Sumba fall into five regional clusters and they all derive from a single Austronesian language which would have been spoken about 3,000 years ago. In Sumba, for the first time we were able to put together genetic information and historical linguistics to track the Austronesian colonization of a single island more than 3,000 years ago. We did this by focusing on the village level, tracking the spread of words and genes from one village to the next. But we're left with a large unanswered question. What was the role of Austronesian women in the colonization of the island? Today, the culture of Sumba is dominated by men. But we know that in the past, at some point, women played a much more important role. So when and where did that change begin? On the island of Flores, just to the north of Sumba, there are said to be some matrilineal villages where descent is traced through the female line and women have a lot of power. Could those villages be relics from the time when the Austronesian culture began to change and women assumed more power? We decided to go to Flores and take a look. This village of Bena in the mountains of central Flores looks a lot like the villages in Sumba. We've got the houses with the tall thatched roofs and the stone tombs to the ancestors just in front of them. But there's an important difference. The villages in Sumba are patrilineal, the men are in charge, whereas here this village is matrilineal. It means that the houses are owned by women, that both men and women inherit their rights to property through their mothers, and so the, the matriline is stronger here. The question we want to ask is, what difference does it make? Biasanya, Bapak, kalau uh, yang diturunkan berdasarkan ibu, yeah. itu warisan biasanya diberikan lebih banyak kepada anak perempuan. Yeah. Nah, apakah di sini juga terjadi hal seperti itu? Yeah. Ya, memang ini sudah turun temurun sejak dari kami punya orang tua. Yeah. Tapi yang peranan adalah perempuan, sedangkan bagaimana perempuan itu untuk pengeluaran atau omong apa-apa, kita harus satukan dengan saudara-saudara orang tuanya In Bena, women have a lot of power. It's one of a handful of matrilineal villages where women own things like livestock and land and children inherit from their mothers. But when we analyze the genetic samples from Bena, we learn that the matrilineal villages on Flores are only a few hundred years old. So the genetic samples from Bena are much too recent to tell us anything about the Austronesian voyagers. But there's still another chance. On the island of Timor, just to the south of Flores, deep in the interior there's another cluster of matrilineal villages. And there's reason to believe that these villages are very old, much older than the matrilineal villages on Flores. Here in Wehali, men still think of themselves as warriors, but as in all matrilineal societies, they share power with women. <laughs> <laughs> 
There are written records from the colonial era that prove that Weihali was a matrilineal center before the first Europeans arrived in the islands 400 years ago. In the center of the innermost village, there's a sacred dwelling for the female rulers of Weihali. The lady to my side here is the Naime, it means she is the ruler of Weihali, so literally dozens of villages will send delegates here if she calls them. This is a matrilineal society, so it means that women own land and property, and so she is the one who ultimately has the choice, the decision to make about how that land and that property will be allocated. <laughs> In this matrilineal society, there are no patrilineal clans. That makes a big difference in the way that the genes flow down through the centuries. The mitochondrial DNA, which everyone inherits from their mother, stays in the community. In the islands of the Pacific, that's the pattern that we see. The genes tell us that the Austronesian women stayed together and sailed all the way to the furthest islands. But what happened to the men? Well, here in Weihali, we might have a model. In other words, they have a myth that the world was an ocean, and then people settled on that in a small island which gradually grew. Now, suppose that were something like the truth. In other words, these voyagers arrive on an island, they establish a, a settlement there, the women stay put, the women inhabit these villages, and they marry with the local men, and then eventually they send out daughter settlements to the next island. And that way they could sort of hopscotch, they could hopscotch across the Pacific, and in the end, you'd get the pattern that we see, which would mean that the original Austronesian voyagers, the whole expansion could have been driven by matrilineal societies. When we analyzed the DNA from all the islands, it confirmed what we discovered in Weihali. About 3,000 years ago, Austronesian voyagers from Asia reached the islands of eastern Indonesia, which were already populated by Papuan hunter-gatherers. The Austronesians built new matrilocal villages just like Weihali. Soon, Papuan men began to marry into the Austronesian villages. Their children would grow up in their mother's village, speaking her Austronesian language and carrying her Asian DNA. But these children would also inherit Papuan DNA from their fathers, and that's exactly the genetic pattern that we see. Thanks to the DNA provided by the islanders, we've uncovered a story that would otherwise have been lost, probably forever. We think of the butterfly effect as triggering chaos, but here it's just the opposite. Over tens of generations, a tiny shift in marriage practices triggered a seismic change in language and culture that spread across half the globe.